Okay, folks, we're talking about trombone today, and I uh, don't have an outline to go with this. You have some materials that were distributed to you in class. In those materials, you should find a sheet from Dr. Randy Kohlenberg, who was my trombone professor, both in my undergrad degree, and I got to take lessons from him again when I was doing my doctorate at Columbia. He's at the University of North Carolina Greensboro now, has been for about 25, uh, going on 30 years, I guess. You have a assembly and maintenance little guide, um, trombone, that was written by a student that I think did a good job on it. It's two pages. And you have a Joe Dixon article about trombone slide action, which has some very, very good advice in it and such. So these are all really good resources. What I want to touch on, basically, though, are just some things that uh, I wanted to remind you of um, in terms of trombone. I'm going to grab my trombone here, and uh, I'm going to back away. So obviously this is a standard trombone. Student line horns will look very much like that, though this isn't a student line horn. Um, in terms of brands, almost all student line horns are really, really pretty good. Uh, anything from China, again, is a little bit uh, less desirable. Um, the Con Preludes a lot of you are using, most of you are using. Um, I would not want to use in a public school setting. If I could avoid it, they wouldn't take the abuse that those kids put on it. Um, they're, they found it. Being used, what little we use them here over those periods of time, they've held up pretty good for seven years, and uh, I think that's good. We've been over assembly and everything. Just reminders from my way of assembly, if the child's sitting down, and I'm going to show you the video from the Essential Elements site that you all have access through to your book um, a little bit later. I'm going to put that on here, and you can look at another variation of it, and that would be a good starting place, and that's a good resource for kids if you forget some of this. But... Um, for this right now, remember, we place the slide down between your knees, the taller side on the left side, and then putting the bell section, and it really works best to hold the bell section here. Okay, remember, we never want to hold it by the tuning slide. And then with the bell section, though on the floor, we put that on the long side, and if they approach it with the bell away from the slide, and I didn't tell you this in class, but it's on that video, you avoid the possibility of the dent of the slide and the uh, trombone. Okay, then approximately a 90 degree angle, tighten the lug nut up, and then mouthpiece out of the case, mouthpiece in the sleeve, and giving it a quarter, half turn, whatever. Uh, don't have to apply too much force or anything. One thing we didn't talk about with mouthpieces, and this is all brass mouthpieces, even your plastic ones, and that the part that's going to go against your face, the rim, um, is really important that, excuse me, I have a phone call that I'm ignoring. There we go. Um, that when we lay it, the mouthpiece down, um, it's okay to lay it down this way on a smooth surface or on a soft surface, but like putting it on a stand can be a really bad idea because that um, rubs some of the silver plating off of it and can eventually. Uh, make that really rough and of course that's what's going on your uh, face the child's face in that so be careful of that too okay and again as we talked about in class all trombones are designed for the tuning slide to probably be pretty close to in tune about that much out okay a little bit less than an inch out and the best way to move the tuning slide is with the thumbs on the counterweight or pushing in on like that okay um, we've gone over slide mix I'm not going to put that back on here. I think you've got the idea for that. If you are going to have to grease this slide, we don't use slide mix We don't want this slide to move easily, but we do want it to move. We don't want it to dry out. The best thing to use for that is... Imagine my embarrassment. I couldn't find it right away. It's a product that's basically anhydrous lanolin. And uh, Shulky makes it. It says slide grease with lanolin. And uh, it's kind of gooey. It's real, real thick. And again, this little jar is a lifetime supply. Um, don't let kids use Vaseline or any other kind of human product to put on here. 
Uh, some different kinds of tuning slide grease are probably okay. Just in terms of tuning slide grease, anything made with lanolin in it, which is a what's an ingredient that's used in a lot of soaps, is really good. Okay, it, it resists tarnishing and getting um, overly goop, and it doesn't dry out very fast, uh, which is a good thing. Okay, good. Remember on the hand position again, um, we start with the left hand, guns up, the brace. This is the one they'll forget. They won't get the thumb around that brace. Fingers come in here, extend the first finger over the mouthpiece comfortably. There shouldn't be a lot of tension here. And then it's as we go to play, that is just balanced. And you'll notice when I bring the horn up to play, it's not like this. Okay, sometimes on TV commercials and stuff, you'll see somebody holding a trombone, uh, sometimes backwards even, but it'll be like that. It is actually more at a, four, the, the 90 degree angle is kiltered off at a 45 degree angle to the body and face, and it just balances on that horn. Then, unlocking the slide, we have our um, Vulcan hand sign right here, and just bring the thumb up, and you sort of have a pitch and catch kind of feel here with those two fingers. And notice how the hand is. We want to try to avoid this because as soon as I do this, I've got tension and I'm pushing up, I'm bearing weight on these fingers. And that's going to create tension and that's going to impact uh, technique. The other thing about this hand position is I can reach the full extent of my hand in one smooth motion from, as you can see, shoulder, elbow working together, and then eventually wrist extending for full length. So that's where we want to be with that. All right. I'm the sure. Let's review that again. The best setup, I think, for trombone, this would be also be for euphonium and to a certain extent trumpet and horn to also, um, is just to get a normal face. So if you'll just ask children to say M and that will work, that face. And as they say M, and we can look at my face right now to do this, M You'll notice and just very normal, nothing outlandish. And then when we go to add the mouthpiece, more or less centered, if anything, a little bit more upper lip than lower lip on trombone and euphonium. Even blowing. <laughs> the outside portions of my face and so forth, there's no tense reactions in my eyes, my nose, and those are all tells all the way around that you can see that the child is just not getting it going. All we want is that air coming through the aperture and so all, whatever tension there is, all happens with inside the mouthpiece and it's just a tube of air coming up the esophagus and then funneled out through the aperture. Okay, you're forming your embouchure, mouthpiece on. Very natural. Again, kids, everybody can buzz their lips. Um, they may not buzz them at the pitch you want, but at least they can go, if nothing else. If they can do that, they can make a sound on a brass instrument. It's just a matter of focusing the vibration. All we're doing is creating a vibration really with the moister part of our lips. Okay? Um, a couple things on trombones. This is often referred to as a single trombone and this is the single trombone generally come in a small bore. So the bore on this is a 0.500 bore at the receptor. This mouthpiece has a narrower shank. I'm going to set my horn down for a second. You will notice that this mouthpiece is larger. This is from the horn I'm going to show you in a second. This is a lar from a large bore horn. These are generally the two, only two sizes of trombone mouthpieces in terms of the shank. A trombone mouthpiece has three basic parts. The rim, actually all brass mouthpieces. The rim, the cup, which has both an inside the cup and an outer cup and then the shank or shaft, all right? And so you can see the small bore mouthpiece actually almost fits inside the large bore mouthpiece. 
This one is 10% bigger. This is a 0.547 bore at the end of the shank. Notice both these mouthpieces, oh, not so much, are should be completely round. You can see this one's got a little bit of a nick right there. We want to avoid that if we can, and that can be straightened out. Um, with a mouthpiece straightener, which most uh, public schools have in stock. And uh, that's important because this will lead to it getting stuck. And the other thing is it's, you know, the air, that's going to create just a little bit of resistance there. So we want to avoid that. And that usually comes through just um, um, not being very cautious about how to handle the horn. And even I did it. So that's embarrassing. Okay, all good. These two mouthpieces on from the... Um, the cup on up are the same. They are both Schulke 52 mouthpieces. They're identical, okay? But they don't work in each horn. This mouthpiece, the gold one, and we'll talk about gold in just a second, will not fit in this horn. It doesn't go in, okay? Difference is the bigger bore horn is in design, probably gonna have less resistance. We hope would end up with a darker sound, a more preferable sound. It's the sound right now, ensemble-wise, for trombone that we're looking for in orchestra and bands and small ensembles and in solo playing. Um, that's a different concept than, uh, say, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, during the big band era, pre-World War II and so forth, the trombone sound concept with much more of a tenor trumpet kind of sound, a thinner, sweeter, more high tenor, um, if you if you will. Now we think of trombone much more, even though it is a tenor instrument, much more as a baritone kind of voice, a dark voice, and so forth. And who knows, in your lifetime, that will probably come full circle again. Um, as far as mouthpieces for beginners, I would recommend a, a Vincent Bach or a copy of a Vincent Bach 6.5 AL. That is a great beginning mouthpiece, will serve an average player all the way through college. Um, I even know five or six years ago, at one point, Mr. Decker was still playing on a six and a half AL. He had gone back to one for a bit. So you've got lots of options like on all instruments and mouthpieces and everything, but that is very, very standard and a very affordable mouthpiece. The mouthpiece that comes with beginning horns generally is a 12 C. That is an awful mouthpiece. It is very small. It is the throat of the mouthpiece, the opening in the bottom of the cup. Um, is very, very narrow. Uh, results generally more often in a, you're likely to get kind of a pinch sound and you're going to have to work really hard to get any kind of darkness to the sound whatsoever. So if you'll request from your music dealer to have six and a half ALs as part of the equipment, they will exchange those mouthpieces out. But coming off the factory line almost universally, the trombone will have a 12C. Some of you are probably said, if you, oh no, you guys all have plastic mouthpieces, never mind. And those are all six and a half ALs, the ones you're playing on. Okay, again, that's a single horn that we talked about. You can get a single horn in a large bore. You can get a single horn in a large bore. And some, especially principal players in symphonic settings like that, because they don't want all that extra tubing, the F attachment, because they're in rehearsals, they're, they're in performances in that long periods of time, and it's just less weight to have to deal with in that. Um, and so that's, that's that. I'm gonna show you an F attachment horn now and we'll do some comparisons. By the same token as you can get a single horn large bore, you can get an F attachment horn small bore. Most of the reason that kids in Texas have F attachment horns horns with this extra mechanism on it is not really to do with the technique of the F attachment at all. What it has to do with is most of these come large bore and the band directors, even if they don't know they want it, that's what, the, that's what they want. They want the darker sound and so forth. So don't, but be careful, getting an F attachment small bore horn might not res, give, give the results you want. Now, the F attachment itself, this, just like my other horn, has, this is the main tuning slide. And I'm gonna pull that out a little bit again. But it also has an F attachment tuning slide, okay? So right here, this mechanism, it has a valve. This is a rotor valve, it's a custom rotor valve. We'll talk about valves here in just a second. But what that does is when I depress that valve, rather than the air traveling up the normal path, just through the tuning slide and back down, 
it pipes it back through all this excess tubing, then through that. So it adds this additional length of tubing is all added to it. And when this is in tune where it should be, and on my horn it has to come out about four inches, three and a half, four inches, that equals the added distance of extending the slide to six position. So what it does by depressing the valve in first position, it moves everything in sixth position to first position. Okay, so like you guys have been playing B flat, C, D, you've had to go one, six, four. If you have an F attachment, you can go one, F attachment, four. Lazy, right? Yeah, okay, well that's why trombone players might be there. Um, while I've got this out too, I'll take my small shank mouthpiece, I'll put this and you'll see it does go in, but it goes in too far and it doesn't fit tightly. So I need the, the large shank mouthpiece. Okay, F attachment valves. Um, this is a, a custom Christian Lindbergh valve, one that was designed about 20 years ago. In fact, this, is, this, this horn has got a very low serial number. It was really one of the very first ones manufactured with this valve. And since then, there have been many variations of trombone valves. Most of your kids will just have a standard rotor that will look exactly like a French horn rotor. And you'll notice the mechanism on this one, what makes this one expensive and what were the, the goal here was, was to make it a very, what's referred to as a short throw. You can see that valve doesn't have to move very far. Um, and also, it's a uh, mechanical mechanism, no strings or anything. Uh, most the uh, more least expensive uh, F attachment horns, there's nothing wrong with them, have um, string linkage like a French horn does, and they have to be tied that way and so forth. But there's many variations. There's rotor valves. Um, there are um, uh, uh, well, you can you can look around through your rehearsals night, and you'll see different shaped things. And if you ask people, they will tell you why they think the theirs is the best one. Um, what I like about the rotor valve is the rotor valves probably take the least amount of maintenance, so I think they're the best choice for a public school setting. Um, just to let you know what's going on here, if this comes off, and then inside there you can see that rotor moves. And what's different, in order to make that short throw, this is built about almost twice the size diameter from the standard rotor or a French horn rotor, which are there. So again, if you're gonna use the F attachment, you have to tune it. You have to tune it. And so a good note to check the tuning on it to is that C, that the C is gonna be in tune. Another thing to keep in mind with trombones with F attachment, we talked about how because of acoustics and to lower a half step you have to increase the slide lengths in percentages by the same percentage each time and so the positions are further apart. Since we're moving sixth position to first position, now when we go to what's the new seventh position with the F attachment, it isn't second position, it's almost a third position. It's like 2.6, the distance between that. It's not the same as without the F attachment. It keeps that, that whole factor of things being further apart continues on the F attachment. So on the non-F attachment side or on the single horn side, remember this please, we have seven slide positions. When you depress the F attachment, your slide now has six positions. You run out of positions. And so this enables me to play low F and then I can go, think, think the positions, I can go F, E, E flat, D, D flat, C before I get to my pedal B flat. So I'm missing B natural. I can't put the slide out far enough to do that. So here's where things get really funky is all of these F attachments are designed that I can pull it additional length. Now it's an E attachment. And the only reason I would do that would be to play that one note, a low B natural, way down in the new extended almost off the slide six position with the F attachment. In all my years of playing, I am 57 years old. I started playing when I was nine years old. 
other than one time in an etude for a lesson, I have never had to do this. I'm going to push that all the way back in. Okay, bass trombones. I don't have a bass trombone here, and bass trombones can be kind of confusing because bass trombones are generally just a regular trombone with yet a bigger bore again. You can have something called and a bigger bell generally. So again, we're trying to get more towards that even darker sound, a more of a bass voice. Um, you can have a bass trombone with just one attachment, an F attachment. And for public school use, that child will probably be just fine. Now, if that child's going to audition in Texas for Allstate, they are probably going to need a double rotor. And what a double rotor is, it gives you one rotor in one key and another rotor in another key. And those two rotors, to add additional tubing, can be used separately or they can be used in combination. So now each position on your horn has four possibilities. No rotor, one rotor, the other rotor, or both rotors. And you will get four completely different pitches. And if you're confused, welcome to the world of bass trombone. Most of them are confused. What they do is they just know for this note, this is what I do, and that's why. They don't really understand how it works. To make it even more confusing, each of these rotors is in one key, and you can tune both of them to a different key. You follow them where this is going? Utter confusion. Okay, utter confusion. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Most high school and even college bass trombone players have really not a very good sense of what their instrument can do. You have to get very, 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 very serious about it to get into that realm. And you as a band director or orchestra director probably aren't going to have to work, worry too much about that. And there's lots of resources on the internet. All right. So that, I believe, pretty much takes care of trombone. Again, everything we've talked about in class matters, and make sure this stays nice. Take a look at, um, I, I do want to call your attention before I shut this down, to the handouts I gave you, especially the one from Dr. Kohlenberg um, about um, working on different facets of tr trombone playing and how trombone players have to work intentionally on some things that maybe some other instruments that are either keyed or valved don't have to spend as much time on because of the um, the, the very uh, large physical motion uh, of the right hand attached with trombone. So you've got lots of resources here between the Kohlenberg material and the Joe, Do, the Joe Dixon the Joe Dixon article. Okay, so I hope that helps, and I know you've just had a thrilling time watching this. You can now do your post for the end of this. Thank you.